Today I want to talk about why we have bones and joints. It's very easy why we have bones. We have bones to stop our bodies from getting all squished together every time we want to exert a force on the environment or the environment exerts some maybe unwanted force on us. So why do you, how do you say stopping getting squished together in more technical terms? You say resist forces of compression. We have bones to resist forces of compression on our bodies. Let's take a look at forces of compression in general. All right. This is a column of some indeterminate uniform material sitting on a surface. And I apply a 10 unit weight to it. 10 kilogram weights, 10 pounds, whatever, makes no difference. Since I've put it directly over the middle of the column, this is referred to as axial loading, right down the axis of the column. And if we want to find out how this column is loaded, we can measure the stress, that is the force per unit area, at some location in the column. If we do that, we can express this graphically or diagrammatically as indicating that at this section of our column with this 10 unit weight on top of it, there will be a compressive stress evenly distributed throughout the column all the way from the left all to the right, no difference. What if I have a really long column and I put a 10 unit weight on top of it and I ask for the stresses at this section? Same section as here, but now I have a very long column. Going to be bigger, smaller, the same. So assuming this is a weightless column, this will be the same, and I can draw the same diagram indicating a uniform compressive stress throughout. Now, let me take a, that same 10 unit force, and instead of applying it axially, that is down the middle of the column, let me apply it at right angles to the column. This is not going to produce a uniform compressive stress. What this is going to do is cause the column to bend such that it is compressed on the surface to your right and stretched on the surface to your left. So it's in compression on this surface and in tension on the opposite surface. And if we want to express that diagram diagrammatically, we show upward arrows indicating tension all the way at the left edge. That will get smaller and smaller as we get to the middle or axis of the column where the actual stress will be zero. And then as we go out to the right surface, the right edge of the column, the compressive forces build up and up until we get to its maximum at the right edge of the column. Different diagram. How different? Yeah, very good. This 10 unit force applied much further away from this is influenced, as this gentleman said, by the fact that it has a much longer lever arm. As a result of that, you're going to get much bigger forces. It's going to try and bend this more at this section, and there'll be big tensile forces on the left-hand side, big compressive forces on the right-hand side, and again, a neutral axis. You can generate much larger forces of compression by bending something than you can by axial loading it. And that's very important the way bones are made. That's a, there is a purpose to talking about this. Here is an eccentric loading. I want to ask you a question about this. Is a situation where you have a 10 pound, 10 unit weight, which is eccentrically placed, because I put a little L-shaped extension here. And if we look at the stress at that section, there will be the same stress due to the axial component of this weight. Then there will be the stress due to the fact that it is eccentrically placed and will cause it to bend, compression on the right side, tension on the left side. And if you add those together, you get a complete picture of what the stress at this section is, where in this case, there's essentially there's no tension in the bones, and, but the compressive force is very much higher uh, than if you had just loaded this axially. So, the bottom line of this, there is a bottom line. The bottom line is you generate much larger forces on bones by bending than you do by axial loading. And the best example of this and how bones are structured to deal with this 
is, not a bone, is a bone that you're not doing with the upper limb. This is a bone of the lower limb. You may recognize this as the femur or thigh bone. Here's the pelvis up here that you certainly should recognize. And when you are standing or jumping or hopping or anything like that, there is a load from your, uh, sac from your hip bone through the, acet through the acetabulum, the joint, the hip joint, um, which passes, the load passes from the hip bone onto the head of the femur, down through the head of the femur, but passes eccentrically to the shaft and then joins at the bottom, which is where the condyles forming your knee joint are. So this is very much like this picture right here. That's how the femur is loaded, typically. All right. If you look at the way the femur is structured, it shows you that. Here is the upper end of the femur in section. Here's the lower end of the femur in section. Here's the head of the femur, which is located virtually in pure axial loading. All right. That goes right through the head of the femur. So the head is axial loading. The condyles down at the bottom are axial loading. It's the shaft which is being bent because the load is eccentrically applied. So here's the head, very thin cortical bone. Bone comes in two gross varieties. One is called cortical bone. Here it is, this white, solid, densely packed bone. And the other is called trabecular or spongy bone, which is lots of little spicules of bone. And this spongy or trabecular bone is very well able to withstand the kinds of levels of loading that come in axial loads. So you see here in the head of the femur, very thin cortical bone and lots of spongy or uh, trabecular bone, and that's quite able to handle those axial loads. But as you work your way down the shaft, you start to develop thick cortical bone because you need thick, dense cortical bone to withstand the very much greater compressive forces that arise from bending. When you get back down to the condylar area again at the bottom of the femur, again, very thin cortical bone and trabecular bone. You can see here the, cor uh, very, uh, you can see here the cortical bone of the shaft getting thinner and thinner and thinner as it comes down on either side. This is quite noticeable all in an x-ray. You look up here in an x-ray of the femur, trabecular bone underlying a thin shell of cortical bone down at the knee. You can't really see it's trabecular but it is in a thin shell of cortical. But look at the cortical bone. It starts here, gets thicker and thicker and thicker, reaches a maximum thickness right there, because that's where the bending load is greatest, and then it gets thinner as you come all the way down again. So when you look at a bone, you find very thick cortical bone where it's being bent, and where it's purely loaded in axial compression, you tend to just handle that with cancellous bone. Here is a bone that you are going to be dealing with in the upper limb. This is the scapula seen by the back. I hope you've had some familiarity with the scapula, and I'm not going to name all the parts of it. Uh, but if you look at it firstly, here's the, this is the blade of the scapula. See these little black areas? The reason they look black is because it's almost translucent. It is so thin in the blade, there's no, no, almost no bone there at all because this is under extremely low compressive loading. And in fact, if we were under zero compressive loading, you'd have no bone. You just, use, you just have connective tissue there. But there's a little bit of compressive loading as the muscles contract uh, t uh, that attach to the scapula, and so you have a little bit of bone there. But where you have really thick cortical bone in a scapula is along its spine and along its axillary border. We're looking at the back of the right scapula. This lateral border of it is called the axillary border because it's up against your axilla, your armpit. That's where you have the really thick cortical bone in your scapula. And the reason you have it there is because of the way the scapula moves when you elevate your arm. When you elevate your arm like that, if I do this, I have 180 degrees of elevation. But about a third of that, 60 degrees, is due to actual rotation of the scapula on my chest. And the other 120 degrees is due to motion at the shoulder joint, which is the joint between the humerus and the scapula. So when you elevate your arm, about a third of it is due to motion of the scapula rotating on your chest. And you can see here the inferior angle is rotated forwards and upwards. What produces that scapular rotation? If you don't have scapular rotation, you cannot elevate your arm more than about 120 degrees. That's it. That's as high as you can go. 
What produces that scapular rotation are two muscles. The most important of one is a muscle which my guess is was destroyed when you removed the chest cage, right? The serratus anterior, tremendously important muscle. Uh, it has an upper part which attaches to the vertebral border of the scapula and is mainly used to pull the scapula forward. It's called protraction of the scapula. And the test for the serratus anterior is you ask a person to lean against the wall like that, and the wall is pushing the scapula backwards. If the serratus anterior part which protracts it is paralyzed, the scapula is, get, is pushed backwards, and you see a ridge on the back of your uh, the skin of your back. It's called winging of the scapula. So, but the biggest part of the serratus anterior is down here, and it all converges on the inferior angle of the scapula, and it pulls that inferior angle forwards and downwards. Uh, and with this part can pull it upwards, but and although my other diagram didn't indicate as clearly as I should have, this part, this fan-shaped part near the bottom that attaches to the inferior angle is the major muscle that rotates your scapula. And if you see its force vector applied here, you can see that what it does is it just, it's, it's, it just bends that bone, just like one of those earlier diagrams. If this is a column of bone, and here's the pull of the serratus anterior, it's perpendicular to the axillary border of the scapula and just bends it. And you get very thick bone here. All right. Here's the trapezius muscle. You know about the trapezius, saw it on the first day of lab. It has an upper part, a lower part, and a middle part. And the upper and lower parts are very important in rotating the scapula if you are abducting. I must tell you, you think, you think of abduction as just raising your arm, but it isn't. Abduction is defined as motion of the arm in the coronal plane. This is flexion of the arm. That's motion of the arm in the sagittal plane. 99 out of 100 elevations don't occur in either of those. They occur sort of halfway in between. That's why this is called elevation of the arm, because it's neither abduction nor flexion, but it's halfway in between those. The, the serratus is important in normal elevation and in flexion. If you go to pure abduction, then the trapezius becomes more important as a rotator of the scapula. That's not, a, it's not that's common emotion, but it can be done. And the upper part of the trapezius pulls the acromion up, and the lower part pulls the tubercle of the spine downward, and that produces a, a, a rotation. And here's the pull of the upper and lower trapezius, and that produces a rotation of the scapula. As you can see, it also will bend the spine of the scapula. So that's why you have very strong bone of the spine is because of the bending action of the trapezius muscle when you elevate. Okay, that's enough about, I'll come back to bone a little bit later, but that's pretty much bottom line is bending produces higher stresses than anything else. That's where you have cortical bone where the, where the bone is subjected to bending. And you've learned a little bit, I hope, about the trapezius and the serratus anterior. How do I define a joint? To me, a joint is a gap between two bony structures that exists for the purpose of motion, to allow motion. This is not the way many anatomy books define joints. They have all sorts of things, and if you read another anatomy book, you may read under the list of joints all sorts of things that I'm going to talk about here that I don't want to call joints because to me, a joint is a gap between two bones that exist to allow motion. So, things that other anatomists call joints. One of them is called a synchondrosis. A synchondrosis is a cartilaginous junction of two osseous or bony structures. Do you know a synchondrosis? I know you know a synchondrosis. Name a syn any synchondrosis of your heart's dream, huh? What? Sphenooccipital synchondrosis, a beautiful synchondrosis. A whole bunch of them at the base of the skull. Cartilaginous junction of two osseous structures. To me, that doesn't deserve to be called a joint, even though it's classified as a joint by many anatomists. Now, see, this is a peculiar lecture, because although it says it's about bones and joints, it's really about a lot of other things, too. For example, in mentioning synchondrosis, it gives me a lead-in to let you know about how bones grow. 
many bones. All the bones of the limb that you will be dissecting. Most of the bones of the body, except for those of the, of the uh, brain case and the face, and the clavicles, most of the bones of the body have little cartilaginous precursors in the embryo and fetus. They're formed in cartilage before they are formed in anything else. And during fetal development, and this will continue uh, into postnatal development as well, as well, these little cartilaginous precursors grow and are converted into bony things, to osseous structures. So here is, I don't know, call that a humerus, if you will, or you know, what difference does it make? The first thing that happens is cartilage has a connective tissue sheath around it, because everything, virtually everything in the body does. I mean, muscle has its connective tissue sheath, which we call fascia. Bone has its connective tissue sheath, which we call periosteum. Cartilage has its connective tissue sheath, which we call perichondrium. The perichondrium, or the connective tissue sheet, sheath of that little cartilaginous baby bone, starts to ossify in the mid-region and forms a collar. This is a three-dimensional structure, imagine. So it forms a collar called the diaphyseal collar or the diaphyseal ossification center. The bone will grow by cartilaginous growth predominantly. It's the cartilage which is increasing and in growing in size. As it does so, the cartilage in the vicinity of the diaphyseal bony collar will start to calcify. Cal you cannot replace cartilage by bone unless you calcify the cartilage first, and it, and it kills it, essentially. So the, the cartilage in the vicinity of the diaphyseal bony collar, which had grown in perichondrium, calcifies, and then it will be destroyed and replaced by bone. And this thing here is now called the diaphysis. It's the shaft. It's in the middle of this long bone. That's where diaphyses are in the middle of these long bones. The zone that adjacent here, which is calci calcifying cartilage being destroyed and replaced by bone, that's called the metaphysis. So it's the area where cartilage is calcified. Once you've reached the stage and have a diaphysis, it's the zone where cartilage has been calcified, destroyed, and replaced by bone. That's called the metaphysis. As you go even further, the cartilage is growing, constantly being calcified and replaced by bone, so the bone appears to be growing longer. You find at the very ends of the bone a second zone of cartilage calcification, destruction, and replacement by bone. And these are called epiphyses. So the diaphysis is the shaft bony element. And at the end, you have these new ossification centers, centers of bony formation, called epiphyses. If we could call this a proximal epiphysis and that a distal epiphysis, if we wanted to view uh, this in anatomic position. As it goes even further, the epiphyseal centers get bigger and bigger, the diaph and remove convert more, most of the proximal and distal ends of the bone to bone, away from cartilage. And you're left with, this is the way a lot of bones look, oh, maybe when you're five or six years old, something like that. Because when you're, when you're born, first, when you're born, a lot of bones look like that. When you're born, a lot of your bones look like that. There's a diaphysis, and the ends are pure cartilage, and you don't see any bone there. Then, when you're two or three years old, five or six, depends on uh, what bone you're talking about, you start to see the formation of epiphyseal centers. And then as you get older, as you approach puberty, really, this is the way your bones look. And the growth of a bone like this is occurring in length by growth of this zone of cartilage, which still exists between the epiphyseal ossification center and the diaphyseal ossification center. And therefore, this zone of growing cartilage is called the growth plate, or the epiphyseal plate, or the physis. In anatomy, everything has five or six names. I think clinicians tend to call it the physis. I tend to call it the epiphyseal plate, and I don't know who calls it the growth plate. It may be everybody. But that is where your bone will grow in length until you reach puberty. And at puberty, what will happen is the bone, bony center of the epiphysis will meet the bony center of the diaphysis 
and will destroy that physis or epiphyseal plate. And at this point, the adult bone does not grow in length. Now, a physis, a growth plate, is a synchondrosis. No, no doubt about it. It is a zone where ossification, osseous elements are connected by cartilage. It is a synchondrosis. Do you want to allow, is it there to allow movement? You bet your life it's not there to allow movement. Any motion of the epiphysis relative to the diaphysis is very, very bad for you. It destroys or breaks through the physis, and that causes it to calcify and get turned into bone, and it stops the growth. So people who have motion of epiphysis relative to diaphysis, that will lead to cessation of growth at that part of, of, of the bone. And therefore, it's a very bad thing to happen. You'll end up with a leg or an arm or something shorter than the uh, opposite side. So it's a synchondrosis, but certainly not there to permit motion. Just like the ones at the base of the skull are not there to permit motion. That it would be horrible to have that. So that was an example. We know synchondroses don't exist to permit motion. There are reasons of growth, really, of bone. And bad to move there. Now, this is because I don't know where else you're going to learn this stuff. There are essentially two ways broken bones heal. This is the upper end of the femur. It's clearly been fractured off the, you know, off the shaft of the femur. You go to the surgeon. The surgeon tries to align them as carefully as he or she can and attaches pins to hold them in place. He can do this with any bone in the arm or anywhere. I just use this example. And if you can align these really well and you can have the, and this is not perfect here, but it's okay. When you can put two ends of bones really tight up and aligned well together, you get a, speeded, a speedy kind of healing. It heals more quickly. It's called direct cortical reconstruction. This is one of the reasons so many fractures are plated and pinned together. There are other reasons, too. For example, now the person actually can bear weight even before the healing takes place. So it's not the only reason you would plate or pin a bone, but it does produce an, he an accelerated healing called direct cortical reconstruction if the two cortices of the fragments are held together very tight and in, in alignment. Here's a different fracture. There's a fracture I'll show of a person. This is the humerus. Here, well, here's the clavicle right there. Here's the head of the humerus up here. Here's the shaft of the humerus. This is, this is a uh, 3D reconstruction from a CT scan. I just thought I'd go around so you could see the whole thing in its beauty. That is one hell of a fracture of the humerus. Not only would it be virtually impossible to realign all those pieces and plate them together properly to get direct cortical reconstruction, but you can just happen to notice that there's another fracture. This little zigzag line here is also a fracture of the surgical neck of the humerus. So there's two fractures in one bone, a horrible mid-shaft fracture and a less horrible fracture of the neck. If you were to try and plate this, it would put so much stress on that one that it would pull apart. And you say, what can you do? You can't plate it. Not possible, for a couple of reasons. This is how they allowed this to heal. The person was not put in a cast or anything, just wearing a sling. It was the only person who just was treated by putting the arm in a sling and waiting, and waiting till it healed by what is called callus formation. Now, what happens is this. Whenever you break a bone, there's a lot of blood that accumulates at the site of the break. That's called a hematoma. Whenever you have a collection of blood, that's called a hematoma. So there's a big hematoma that will form here. You don't see that on the x-ray because... Blood is the same tissue density as muscle and things like that, so you don't see it there. It is not distinct in radiologic contrast, but it is a big hematoma here that you know exists. And what will happen is, in every broken bone, that hematoma will be invaded by a highly vascularized fibrous tissue and turned into a fibrous structure, connective tissue like you know about. That connective tissue, that vascularized fibrous tissue, will then turn into a fibrocartilage, then into a cartilage. The cartilage will be calcified, and the bone will replace it. I don't know at this point whether there's been any calcification, 
But if you go at five weeks, you see there's a little white feathery stuff right there. That is already signs of calcification of cartilage, which has, by this stage, the, fibro, the hematoma has already converted to fibrous tissue, and the fibrous tissue has already started to convert to cartilage. And the cartilage is starting to calcify right here. You can see some. If you go to this level, you can see some further calcification here. And calcification near that ring is nothing. And even more, and you can find, now look at, by this time, this is bone. Probably even bone at this time. The calcified cartilage is being replaced by bone. You get this big lump here. And in a year, that bone is completely and strongly knitted together by this process called healing by callus formation. If I had had x-rays at two and three years, it would not even look this ugly. It would actually sort of straighten itself out and look much more like a normal humerus. But this is still early in the healing process, early enough that it's stable, completely stable at this point, probably even stable at seven months, to be honest with you. Uh, but uh, it still looks funny. So those are the two ways bone heal, by direct cortical reconstruction and callus formation. This patient was in her 60s at the time. It is actually takes longer. In the older you are, it takes longer. That is absolutely true. Anyway, synchondroses are not joints by my definition. Syndesmoses. If a synchondrosis is a cartilaginous junction of two osseous elements, a syndesmosis is a connective tissue junction of two osseous elements. You probably haven't come across any... That you, that you needed to know the names of. This is one you'll need to know the name of before your dissection of the upper limb is over. It is a ligamentous connection between the distal end of the clavicle and the coracoid process of the scapula. Now, these, this, these things have names, these ligaments. One's called the conoid ligament. One's called the trapezoid ligament. I don't believe in this course you would ever be asked to know those things. But you should know that there is something called the coracoclavicular syndesmosis. That's what it's called. The fibrous joining of two osseous elements, clavicle and scapula, by tough ligamentous structures here. The purpose of this syndesmosis is not to allow motion between the clavicle and the scapula. The purpose of this syndesmosis is, in fact, to prevent damage to the joint between the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula, which is called the acromioclavicular or AC joint. What happens when a blow is applied to the tip of your acromion process is it tries to drive the scapula medially, and that attempt to drive the scapula medially in a normal person is transmitted through the syndesmosis into the clavicle and down the clavicle and is absorbed at a very strong joint, the sternoclavicular joint. However, if the force tending to drive the scapula medially is too great, it can tear the ligamentous fibers of this coracoclavicular syndesmosis, and that will lead to a dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint. In other words, the acromion will, will head medially, this will tear, and will continue medially, and will pass underneath the clavicle. It can also happen if you fall on an outstretched arm. Driving the scapula medially, tearing the coracoclavicular syndesmosis, and allowing the acromion to pass medially under the clavicle. This dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint, a very, very weak joint, its integrity depends almost entirely on that syndesmosis protecting it. Dislocation of that acromioclavicular joint is called shoulder separation. That is not the same as shoulder dislocation. It's a different joint entirely. Shoulder dislocation does not occur at that AC joint. Shoulder separation does. In the old days, when a person had shoulder separation, they would take the coracoacromial ligament, separate it from its attachment sites, and nail it into position of the old syndesmosis here, and we try and return everything to a semi-normal location. I have read that nowadays they don't bother. These are ways that you can have medially directed forces applied to your chromium to tear that coracoclavicular syndesmosis.
Here's another syndesmosis. This is one between the radius and the ulna of your forearm. It's called the interosseous membrane, but it forms a radial ulnar syndesmosis, a connection of the radius and ulna by connective tissue. And the fibers all run from distally on the ulna to proximally on the radius. Why do we have this syndesmosis? When you fall or on your hand or push on your hand hard, the forces pass from the hand through the wrist joint almost entirely into the radius. You haven't dissected this joint, but when you dissect it, you will see that there's a big fibrous cushion here called the triangular fibrocartilage between the ulna and the wrist bones. And it's very cushiony and absorbent, whereas there is no such cushion between the radius and the wrist bones. So almost all forces, when you fall down, are transmitted from your hand into your radius. In fact, 90% of all of the force transmitted from your hand into your forearm passes through the joint of the wrist bones with the radius, and only 10% passes in the joint between the ulna and the wrist bones. That is very bad to have some, such high force. If 90% of that force were transmitted up here between the radius and humerus, and only 10% of that force is that you, from the landing on the hand, is transmitted between the ulna and the humerus, you really are putting an awful load on the humeroradial joint compared to the humeral ulnar joint. And it will damage the humeroradial joint, which is actually much smaller than the humeral ulnar joint. So what happens is, is as the radius starts to shift proximally, it puts tension on the fibers of this interosseous membrane, which I told you were always oriented from distal on the ulna to proximal on the radius, and transfers some of that load to the ulna, so that when you finally get up to your elbow joint, you've dropped from 90% to 60% on the radius, and therefore the load at the elbow is almost equally shared between radius and ulna. So this syndesmosis, just like the coracoclavicular, had nothing to do with allowing motion. This too has nothing to do with allowing motion. It stops, in essence, the radius from being driven proximally uh, too far and shifts some of that over to the ulna. The suture. Is the suture a joint? Anybody want to say yes? You want to say yes? No. no. Well, suture, as you know, is a, is a kind of syndesmosis, this particular kind, as a connective tissue joining between two flat bones of the skull. It is a joint at one moment in your entire life, and that is when you are born. It exists. Those osseous elements are connected by connective tissue or separated by connective tissue, if you will, to allow them to move relative to one another during the birth process. And it's very important that they do, because otherwise you will crush the bones of the, child, of the infant during delivery. Once you are born, they change completely from being there to allow motion to being there to stop motion. And the sutures become interdigitated and try and make your skull as rigid as possible. So sutures are a special kind of syndesmosis that do or qualifies joints in my way of thinking at the moment of birth, but never thereafter. Thereafter, they're just growth centers. You need to have connective tissue between the bones of the skull to allow rapid growth. Symphysis is a fibrocartilaginous joint. I won't uh, ask you anything about it to say uh, the intervertebral, bisque, intervertebral discs are symphyses. So they would call it, classify as real joints by my definition because those intervertebral discs exist to allow motion between the bodies of vertebrae. There is a symphysis between your right and left pubic bones. You might consider it a joint by my definition because during pregnancy, there is a motion, a widening of the pubic symphysis, and I may widen even further at the moment of birth, but I'm not certain. So it's good to have some motion there if you're a woman. I cannot conceive of any reason to have motion there if you are a man, or if you're a woman who is not in the pregnant or not delivering, I don't know why you'd want to have motion there either, 
But uh, certainly at some moment in time, you would have to say it acts to a lot of motion. And now we get to real joints, all right? The things that uh, always satisfy my uh, definition, and that is a synovial joint. A synovial joint is a genuine gap between two bony structures to allow motion. And the basic structure of a synovial joint is we have a bone. This will be the proximal bone. You can pretend it's a humerus. This will be a distal bone. You can pretend it's a, a radius, you can, anything you want. And there is a uh, cartilaginous covering to the end of the bone. And that cartilaginous covering is actually derived from the fundamental cartilage of your, that was created when you were a fetus. That is called articular cartilage that covers the ends of these bones. The bone underneath here, that thin plate of cortical bone here is called the subchondral plate of bone. We know that most joints have just axial loads through them, so you don't need very thick uh, cortical bone there. Uh, each gap, the synovial joint being a gap between the articular cartilaginous surfaces of two bones, uh, is surrounded by a connective tissue sleeve called the capsule of the joint. And the capsule is a regular uh, American connective tissue, and then it is lined by a much thinner tissue, which you'll learn about in some other course, called synovial membrane. Synovial membrane is extremely important for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it produces a lubricant, which is so phenomenal that the friction between the articular cartilage and surfaces is less than that between Teflon and Teflon. And no, no human has ever been able to produce a lubricant as good as synovial fluid is. It's just phenomenal. So it means that these bones, these articular cartilaginous surfaces, can slide on one another in an essentially a friction-free environment. And there's just this film of fluid in between them, which has this lubricant in it. And it's called synovial fluid. Now, all synovial joints have this structure, or this basic structure. And they all are gaps to allow motion between bones. And the only thing you have to do as a student of anatomy, of gross anatomy, is to say, not every conceivable motion is desirable at every joint. Some joints like to limit the motion to one or two planes, like the elbow joint. Likes to limit it to just flexion and extension. How is a joint structured to limit the motion to the desirable planes? So that's how you analyze a synovial joint anatomically. Well, I'm not going to analyze every joint in the body for you here. The elbow is, is, has lots of interlocking bony surfaces and ligaments that keep it so it can only extend and flex. And you are all in their joint. Uh, other joints have much less limitation of motion. The shoulder joint has extremely little limitation of motion. But of course, there's one kind of motion that no joint can tolerate, and that's called dislocation. Uh, a dislocation of a joint is when the two opposing articular cartilage and surfaces aren't in contact at all anymore. A partial dislocation, when they slide relative to one another and have partial contact, that's called a subluxation of a joint. You don't want that either. You don't want any joint to undergo a subluxation, which is a partial dislocation, or a complete dislocation where the cartilage and surfaces don't contact one another anymore. Every joint has to have a mechanism to prevent that. And the shoulder is the one we'll look at now. This is an upper limb part of the course. How does the shoulder allow tremendous motion and yet prevent itself from subluxing and dislocating? So here's a lateral view of the glenoid cavity. Uh, and I've labeled the things that you can see there, so I don't need to talk about them more. And here is the humerus placed in position. In, in, in that joint between the head of the humerus has articular cartilage on its surface, and the glenoid cavity has articular cartilage on its surface. It's called the shoulder joint. So when it dislocates, that's a shoulder dislocation. When the AC joint dislocates, that's a shoulder separation, I said before. Now, when you're just standing there, gravity is, is pulling down on your upper limbs. That in and of itself would, would, would create a subluxation of the joint. And what stops that, and this is proven in a, and I won't tell you now because unless someone wants to know, proven in a very elegant way, is the fact that the synovial fluid's under negative pressure. 
and it tightens the capsule. Just being under a pressure which is less than the atmospheric, it sort of sucks the capsule in and makes the capsule tighter. And that in and of itself, tightening the capsule, is enough to prevent your shoulder from subluxing under gravity all by itself. And if you break that, I mean, if you break that, this was, I said I wasn't going to tell you, but I will. If you put a hypodermic needle in a, a fresh cadaver joint and you put it in through the capsule and allow air to get into that synovial space, the limb immediately subluxes. So it's very clearly just atmospheric pressure that allows that. But of course, the greatest risk to your shoulder is not just standing around doing nothing, all right, but is playing football and skiing and things of all that nature, which you will learn that all forms of athletics are bad for you. Uh, now, since you haven't done this dissection yet, I have to tell you the names of some muscles around the shoulder joint. You're going to see today in lab the supraspinatus muscle, which arises above the spine of the scapula and inserts onto a bump uh, uh, called the greater tubercle, onto the superior surface of the greater tubercle of the humerus. You'll see the infraspinatus, which arises below the spine of the scapula, inserts onto the greater tubercle more behind or posterior to the head uh, than on top of it. And you'll see a tiny little muscle of no consequence, but I put it in here to be complete, called the teres minor, which also inserts on the greater tubercle uh, on the posterior surface of it. In an anterior view of the scapula, this you will not see in lab today, and I'm not sure when you'll ever see it, to be honest with you, but um, is a big muscle called the subscapularis, so it arises from the anterior surface of the scapula, and it inserts onto a different bump here called the lesser tubercle, of the humerus uh, in front of the joint. Now, and you'll see that more clearly in the next slide. All of these muscles produce various rotations of the arm. The supraspinatus rotates it, so it elevates. Infraspinatus and teres minor rotate, so it la produces lateral rotation primarily. Subscapularis rotates it, so it produces medial rotation. So these are all rotators. But if you look at the joint, the tendons form a cuff around the shoulder joint. So hence, these are called rotator cuff muscles because they rotate, their actions are rotate, rotatory, but their tendons all form a cuff around the shoulder joint with the supraspinatus tendon being passing superior to the joint, infraspinatus and teres passing posterior to the joint, subscapularis passing anterior to the joint. And it's these muscles which really protect the shoulder joint from dislocation. They act as barriers so that if something tries to push upward really hard on your humerus, the supraspinatus contracts and stops it from dislocating upward. If something pushes backwards on your humerus, the infraspinatus, and to a lesser extent, teres minor contracts and stops it from dislocating posteriorly. And if something pushes forward, the subscapularis contracts and prevents it from dislocating anteriorly. So these are, these are the main things that prevent dislocation and subluxation of the shoulder joint. But that's, I've drawn them when I'm just standing, this is my right, when I'm just standing like this. That's what these things look like. But you don't tend to dislocate your arm very much when it's, you know, people don't come and poke you in the back and the front. Things happen to your arm when it's, when it's being used and active. And every time you elevate your arm, every time you elevate it, it laterally rotates automatically. This is something you should try yourself. If I'm using now my forearms just to, to tell me the direction, the rotatory state of my humerus. So if I go like this, my humerus is laterally rotated. If I go like that, it's medially rotated. I'm just using my forearms as a guide. If I do not allow my humerus to rotate, and I know some of you can do it better than I can, this is as high as I can go. If I want to get higher than this, I have to laterally rotate, and then I can go like that. It's an, it's, it has to do with the way the greater tubercle fits in relationship to the acromion process and things like that. Bottom line is all natural elevations of the arm involve lateral rotation. They all do. It's automatic. Every time you elevate your arm, you get lateral rotation. That means that when your arm is elevated, 
those cuff muscles don't have the same relationship that they did when it's hanging by the side. The supraspinatus and infraspinatus, anteriors minor are all pretty much at the back. The subscapular, I mean, this is exaggerated drawing. The subscapularis is rotated so now it's over the top of the joint. What does this mean? It means the front of the joint is no longer protected by any of these muscles. So this is when your arm is in the greatest risk of a dislocation that will push the head of the humerus anteriorly out of the joint. This is what happens when a quarterback goes to throw the ball and a lineman comes and smacks that way. It just pivots the head right out. Or if you're skiing, this, these are, I would never do any of these things. So I'm just, I understand that when people ski, they can plant the pole in the ground like that. And if it goes this, it'll pivot the head out again and you'll get an anterior dislocation. If you hit a tree, you'll get a posterior dislocation. That's because even though you've got a lot of muscles there to stop it, those muscles can't stop that kind of force. But you don't need that much of a force to get an anterior dislocation in an elevated arm. And so that is absolutely the most common type of shoulder dislocation is an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. And it usually has a little, uh, the, usually falls a little bit inferiorly as well. So this is a person, you look at this x-ray, you haven't re done x-rays yet, but you can pretty much tell here's the head of the humerus here. Here's the glenoid there. They're not situated in perfect alignment. When you look at it from the side view, and this is the glenoid right here. That's the glenoid. Here's the head. It's anterior and inferior in position. That is by far the most common type of dislocation, anterior and inferior dislocation, due to the fact that every time your arm is elevated, the subscapularis rotates out of position to prevent it from dislocating that way. Uh, one other example of how a joint is configured to not, in this case, not prevent dislocation, but to limit motion in a certain way, in a certain position. When your fingers are straight, you can spread them apart and bring them together again. Very important for manip manipulation, to be able to move them apart and together. When you want to grab a, a uh, whatever this thing is, <laughs> laser printer or a hammer, more likely, you don't want that side-to-side -side wobble of your fingers. That's going to that's going to make this an unstable grip. You want to have these fingers rigid. So if you flex your fingers, you can barely spread them apart. If they're extended, you can go like that. When they're flexed, you can barely move them apart. That is to give you a stable grip with flexed fingers. And the way the joint is configured to allow this is the following: on the surface, both lateral and medial surface, this is a metacarpal bone proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, distal phalanx. This is called the metacarpal phalangeal joint or MCP joint. There's a ligament on the inside, medial side, and outside lateral side of every metacarpal phalangeal joint. Here, the metacarpals are the bones you know, of, the, of the, your, the back of your hand and in, in your palm, and the phalanges are the bones of the free parts of your fingers. There are these collateral ligaments, medial and lateral collateral ligaments for every joint. And they are not so tight when your fingers are straight, and they allow you to spread your fingers apart. Here are their sites of attachment on the metacarpal and on the proximal phalanx. When you flex, these two red dots move further apart from one another because of the shape of the joint. And as these two red dots move further apart from one another, the collateral ligaments get tight. And therefore, that in and of itself is the reason that explains why you have so little abduction possible. When your finger is flexed, just the shape of the joint tightening these collateral ligaments, giving you stability at the metacarpophalangeal joint when your fingers are flexed so you can grab things tightly without having a wobble there. All right, what do you really want to know about joints? You're going to go, what, you have an exam tomorrow? You're going to go to a bar after this exam for sure. All right. And... You're going to be there, and you're going to find an attractive person at that bar who you would like to impress for one reason or another. And so that you'll say to that, that attractive person, you'll say, hi, how are you? And uh, the person will say, what do you do? You'll say, well, I'm a medical student. 
because that's going to impress them for sure. And then that person will say, well, what are you studying now? Oh, I'm studying joints. What question will they ask you? Indisputably. The only question anybody on earth is interested in about joints, and I don't mean the kind you smoke. They will ask you, what makes joints crack? So if you want to impress this person, you are not going to be told the answer as to what makes joints crack. Here's what happens, why joints can be cracked. A joint is a closed space with fluid, synovial fluid, which is largely water. It has lubricants and some other proteins in it and things like that. It's largely a water, enclosed water space. Here's a diagram of an enclosed water space. If you jerk or pull on the handle of that piston, you pull upwards on it very rapidly, you will subject that water to tension. Two things will happen. If there's any dissolved gas in the water, that gas will come out of solution and form little bubbles. That's the white things are little bubbles of oxygen and nitrogen and things like that are there in fluids of your body. And that is called gaseous cavitation when that happens. On the other hand, water itself, if put under tension, forms vapor bubbles called vaporous cavitation. You get these two types of gas form. One is water vapor bubbles. The other is gas bubbles. The water vapor bubbles are inherently very unstable, and they immediately collapse after forming. And just like thunder causes air to come together and make a noise, when all of these millions of water vapor bubbles, their collapse makes a noise. The noise that they make when the water vapor bubbles uh, collapse is the cracking sound you hear uh, when you do a joint. Then what happens is, you say, well, can I do it? Why can't I? Sometimes you can't crack them right away, right afterwards. I don't know if you ever tried. And the answer is this. You have to wait till those gaseous bubbles re-dissolve before you can put the water under tension again. Because if you try to do it again immediately, all you're doing is expanding the gas bubbles, which are still out of solution. So it's not till they re-dissolve that you can ever put the uh, water under tension again and get vapor bubbles. Uh, now, muscles and bones. This is a highly diagrammatic drawing of a humerus, a radius, and a hand. And you're holding a heavy, you're gonna, I'm going to show a person holding a heavy weight in their hand. Now, just flexing the forearm like this can easily be done with brachialis, really, but I've shown biceps here because I don't know why. Um, and if I want to hold a heavy weight in my hand, look what's going to happen to the bone of the forearm. It is going to be pulled up by the biceps or whatever flexor I have, pulled down by the weight, and that will cause compression on this surface and tension on that surface. And that's not good for the bone to be bent like that. I mean, it puts the bone at risk. It certainly can withstand it, but, you know, depending on how heavy the weight is, maybe it can't withstand it. So we have a second muscle that we use when we lift heavy weights, not just the bicep. And the brachialis isn't going to help you at all either. The brachialis is attached to the ulna. Uh, the second muscle you use when you apply heavy weight is the brachioradialis muscle, muscle you'll be looking at today in lab, which runs, attaches distally on the humerus and attaches distally on the radius, and therefore is almost parallel to the radius. But it has a, a, if you look at its leverage and you look at the components of its vector force, one of those components is a component perpendicular to the shaft of the radius. And that will, in fact, that component of pulling the brachial radius will tend to pull the radius in the, uh, bend it in the opposite direction as our weight. And therefore, using brachial radialis when lifting heavy weights reduces the strain on the bone of your forearm. So that's a function of brachial radialis that you ordinarily wouldn't think about. Now, you can say to yourself, can this stuff really be important? But it can really be important. And it became very clear to me that this can really be important 
when years ago, so long ago, I'm not sure you were born, there used to be a show on TV called The Wide World of Sports on ABC. And for some reason, every year they used to show the uh, United States Arm Wrestling Championships. So, I'm watching the United States Arm Wrestling Championships. Now, I want to demonstrate arm wrestling. I was thinking maybe get George Taylor down here or Justin, or Justin Putnam down here. Oh, I see no, 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 no. But I would embarrass them too much. So I want Nicole Rivera to come down here. Right. Thank you very much. The force, the force that she's applying is perpendicular to the bones of my forearm. What is stopping the force she applies? from breaking my forearm bone. What's stopping it is, in fact, the muscles on the anterior or ventral aspect that are gripping her tightly with, because it's a grip with the fingers, are gripping Nicole's hand tightly with my fingers. And those muscles are all are on the anterior aspect of the forearm. And I'm watching these guys in the American Championship, and they're fighting like crazy, even stronger than Nicole is. And all of a sudden, you can see one of the guys relaxes his grip a little bit, just to shift. And the minute he turns off his forearm digital flexors, his flexors of the fingers, his arm forearm just snaps in half. Now, I don't have a picture of that, but I got one equally disgusting. In arm wrestling, it's a bad idea to challenge someone bigger than yourself. And Simon is about to learn that lesson the hard way. He actually appears to be holding his own until his much bigger buddy breaks more than his spirits. Don't forget, muscles can do all sorts of things for you you wouldn't ordinarily think of. 